Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna be continuing the Flask series and learning how to deploy our Flask application to a web server so that anyone with internet access can use it within a browser. So, so far we've created this application with some good functionality, but the site still only lives on our local machine. Uh, right now, this is just running in my browser on my local machine, but no one else can access this. So the point of building these sites is to deploy them so that they're accessible over the internet. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, deploying can be a bit tricky. It can be overwhelming because there are a lot of different ways to deploy an application, and it's hard to know exactly what's best for your specific application. So we're going to look at several deployment options in this series. So we're going to look at how to deploy to our own Linux server, how to deploy to Heroku, and possibly some others. So in this video, we're going to be learning how to deploy our application to our own Linux server using Nginx and GUnicorn. Now, if you watched my Django series, then I deployed the Django application using Apache and ModWizGy. But the reason I used Apache and ModWizGy in that video is because it's recommended on Django's site. But with Flask, I think it'll be best for us to use Nginx and GUnicorn. So when you deploy to a Linux server, you're most likely going to be deploying to a virtual machine that is hosted by a company. So that's going to be a company like Linode or DigitalOcean or AWS. Now, I personally use Linode for my own web applications, so that's what we'll be using in this video. And Linode was actually kind enough to sponsor this video as well and has provided me with a link where you all can get $20 of free credit towards an account. So if you want to follow along with this video, then I'll leave that link in the description section below where you can sign up for an account and get enough credit to follow along. I've been using their services for my own personal website for years, so I was really happy when they contacted me about sponsoring a video. Uh, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so like I said, we're going to be deploying to a Linux server. This method of deployment actually takes the most effort to set up, but is also the most flexible in terms of what control you're going to have uh, over your application and web server. So in future videos, we'll look at deployment options that offer some free tiers, but they usually only offer basic services. So for example, if you want to use your own domain name, like, you know, myflaskblog.com or something like that, then you'll have to upgrade to a per paid service on those free options in order to set that up. And even then, you won't have the freedom and possibilities that you get when you have your own virtual private server. So the way that we're going to do it in this video will give you a lot of freedom and room for your application to grow, but it's not as simple as some of the other methods. So there definitely are some trade-offs there. So like I said, I'm going to be using Linode to deploy this application to a Linux server. So that's my personal preference, but you can do the same deployment with any Linux server that you can access via SSH. Now I already have an account with Linode, so I'm going to pull that up here in the browser. So let me reload this page to make sure I'm still logged in. Now I'm going to show you how to create and set up a Linux server from scratch because that's what a lot of you have requested. But if you already have a server ready to go and want to skip directly to the Flash specific deployment, then I'll put a timestamp in the description section below where you can jump to that part. So uh, if you create an account with Linode, then you should be able to access a page like this uh, that I have in front of me here. Now this is their new cloud manager at cloud.linode.com. There's also a Linode manager at manage.linode.com. But I think that's older and they are suggesting that people switch over to this. So this page gives me access to all of my current Linode servers. So you can see here that I already have one created for my personal website called Cori MS Server. But we're going to create a new one from scratch to deploy our Flask application. So let's go ahead and do that now. So to do this, I can just come up here to create. So I'm going to click on create and we're going to click on Linode. So Linode is their names for their Linux server. You can see here it says high performance SSD Linux servers for all your infrastructure needs. So I'm going to click on that. And now we choose our image or our operating system. So I'm going to use Ubuntu here, Ubuntu 18. And now we need to choose a region. I'm just going to choose Dallas, Texas. But you can see that they also have regions in Europe and Asia as well. Uh, so you probably want to choose a server that is going to be close to your audience. So I'm going to choose Dallas, Texas because it's a nice midpoint in the United States. Okay, so now we can choose our Linode plan. So these are the standard plans here. You can see uh, some of the computer specs and the prices. So this is $10 a month, $20 a month, uh, one CPU, 50 gigs of storage, two gigs of RAM. 
Uh, they also have something here called a Nanode. Now, this is a low performance machine, but it's also a cheaper option. Uh, so you can see this is one CPU, 25 gigs of storage, and one gig of RAM. Uh, but since our application is pretty simple and we're just testing this out and trying to deploy it, I'm just going to choose this cheapest option because it's not going to take a lot of resources. Okay, so now let's choose a label. So I'm just going to call this flask dash server. And I'm going to skip and not add any tags here. And now we're going to add a root password. So I'm going to add a root password of just this is a test with some capitalization in there. Uh, but you're going to want a stronger root password, obviously, uh, for your own server. Now, you're definitely going to want to remember this password as well, because this is what you're going to use to first log in to the system. Now you can see that they have some optional add-ons here, such as backups and private IP. Uh, I would probably recommend getting a backup if this is going to be your production server uh, so that you don't have to worry about it. But I'm not going to do it for this since we are just testing this deployment. Uh, so I'm just going to come over here and click on create. And now it's going to create this server. So we can see here that it's now provisioning the server. And after it provisions it, then it will boot the server up. So I'm going to skip forward to where this is complete. Uh, so I will resume once this is finished. Okay, so our new server has finished booting up and that only took a couple of minutes. Uh, so now we can see it here in our list of Linodes. If we go to dashboard, then we can also see uh, the Linode server listed there as well. Um, so now all we need to do is click on this server and then go to the networking tab. And once you're in the networking tab, you can see here that we have this SSH command. So this SSH command is how we're going to first access our machine. Um, now you're going to want to write down this IP address because we're going to be using that a lot throughout this video. So I'm going to write mine down right now. It is uh, 45.33. Dot one two three dot two one four. Um, so now I'm going to copy this SSH command, and now I'm going to paste this into my command line uh, to log in to my server. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, then you might not have access to the SSH command. There are other tools that you can use that allow you to SSH into a server. So one of the more popular tools is called Putty. But personally, what I recommend if you're on a newer version of Windows is to simply install the Linux Bash shell on Windows, and you'll be able to SSH through that. Now, I'm not going to show that process in this video, but I do have a separate video detailing that whole process, and I'll put a link to that in the description section below. Uh, and also Putty here. I also have this opened up here in the browser. If you do want to download Putty, that is at putty.org. So you can find that there, and there will be instructions for how to use SSH with Putty on that site in their documentation. But if you are using Linux Bash Shell, then it will allow you to more easily follow along with all of the commands in this video. Okay, so if you are using Bash, then we'll want to copy that SSH command from our networking tab in Linode, and we'll paste that into our command line. Now, I have two different terminal windows opened up here. Now, one of these I'm going to use to run commands on my local machine, and one I'm going to use to run commands on our remote Linode server. Now, you don't have to do it this way, but if you only have one terminal window open, then you'll have to go back and forth between your local machine and your server, so I think it's easier to simply have two windows open. Okay, so I'm going to paste that SSH SSH command here into the terminal on my left side. And we can see that this does an SSH of our root. So that's the root user at this IP address. Now yours is going to be your IP address for your server. And then it's going to ask us if we want to continue the connection. It's only going to ask us the first time that we do this. So I'll say yes. And now it's asking for that root password. So this is the root password that we created when we created our node. So mine was this is a test. And I'm going to delete this server after the video so you can't, you know, log in to this IP address with this root password or anything like that. Okay, so now we are connected to our Linode server. So this is the machine that we just created. Uh, now, just to get some more room here, I'm going to minimize this uh, terminal here on the right and expand this over to where we have some more room to work with here. Okay, so now we're working with a bare bones Ubuntu server. So we're going to want to do a couple of things to get this set up first. So first of all, let's upgrade the software. And this is going to be like security updates and stuff like that. You're going to want to always do this uh, the first time you log into a Linux system. So I'm going to do apt update and then these two ampersands and apt upgrade. And that's just going to update and upgrade the software on the system. 
So some of these updates can take a long time. So I'm just going to fast forward the video until this is complete. And you're occasionally going to be asked if you want to continue. And I'm just going to hit yes anytime those come up. Okay, so I fast forward to where those updates and upgrades were complete, and that took a couple of minutes. Uh, so now we're going to want to set our host name on this machine. So I'm going to clear my screen here. And now to set this host name, I'm going to say uh, host name CTL set dash host name. And I'm just going to call this flask dash server. So now if I actually type in host name, then it should say flask server there. So that's good. Uh, so now we also need to set this host name in our host file. So to do that, I'm just going to use the program nano since nano is an easy editor that a lot of people know how to use. So I'm just going to say nano forward slash etc forward slash host. And within this host file, we're going to want uh, right under our 127.0.0.1, we're going to want to put in our IP address of this machine. So I said to write that down because you're going to be using it a lot. Mine was 45.33.123.214. And after that, then we're going to want to hit tab and then put in our host name again. So I called mine flask dash server. And now to save this in nano, you hit control X to exit. And then it's going to ask you if you want to save. So I'm going to hit Y as for a yes. And then the file name that you want to write. If you just want to keep the same file name, then you just hit enter. So now uh, that saved uh, that host name to our host file. Okay, so now let me clear my screen here. Now we're going to want to add a limited user to our machine. So right now we're logged in as the root user. Now the root user has unlimited priv privileges and can execute any command. Now that might sound nice, but it's best practice to add a new user that has limited privileges that you use as your main account, and you'll still be able to run admin commands using sudo. It's just a lot more safe than running everything as root. So to do this, we can just say add user and now the username of the user that you want to add. I'm going to add mine as Corey MS, but you want to add whatever yours is here. Uh, now again, okay, so now it's asking us for our password. So I'm just going to uh, put in something like this is a test. Uh, this is a test. And now it's asking us to fill in some information about our user. Now this is optional. You can put this in if you'd like. So, you know, full name, I'll put in my full name, but I'm just going to uh, leave like the room number and all that other stuff blank. Then it's going to ask you if that's correct. And I will just accept the default as yes. So let me clear the screen here again. Now, again, I did use Ubuntu as our operating system. So if you used something different, something like CentOS or Red Hat or Fedora, then these commands are going to be different. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so now that we've created that user, now we're going to want to add that user to our sudo group so that they can run those admin commands. So I'm going to do add user, Corey MS, and then after that, do sudo. And that will add them, it says here, adding Corey MS to the group sudo. So that's good. Okay, so now that we've created this new user, now we're going to want to log out of the our server and log back in as that user because we don't want to be uh, logged in as root longer than we have to. It's just best practice to be logged in as a limited user. So I'm going to exit out of our server and now I'm back on my local machine. So I'm just going to hit the up arrow to run that same uh, SSH command that we ran before. But instead of root, we are going to log in as the user that we created. So I'm going to log in as Corey MS and it's going to ask us for a password. So that was this is a test. And now we are logged in as the new user that we created. So now I'm going to clear my screen here. Okay, so now that we're logged in with this new user, we're going to want to set up SSH key based authentication so that we can log into our server without a password. So at this point, I know that some of you might be thinking to yourselves, like, you know, oh, why do I have to do all of this stuff? I just want to deploy my Flask application. Well, the reason that we're doing all of this is because, you know, a lot of people had requested to set up a Linux server from scratch. And this is what it's like to deploy a real world application and to put the proper 
proper precautions in place on your web server. So that includes best practices like setting up SSH keys and firewalls. And you're going to want to do that on any real world application that you deploy. So I may as well include it in this tutorial instead of just showing you the bare minimum. So when it comes to these SSH keys, by default, we're using a password to log in to our web server, just like we just now did. We instead want to use key-based authentication. So this is more secure and also more convenient because it uses keys that can't be brute forced. And it also uses uh, allows us to log in without putting in our password every time, which is great for running remote scripts that connect to your web server. Now I have a separate video on this SSH authentication as well. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of these commands, but we are going to run through all of the, uh, the whole process here. So if you want to know more details about what these commands are doing, then you can watch that video and I'll put a link to that in the description section below. Now there's actually an easier way to do this by using a command called SSH copy ID, but it's not available on all operating systems. So instead, we're just going to do this the longer way. Uh, so on our server here, we're going to want to make a dot SSH directory. So I'm here in my home folder. If I do a PWD, you can see that we are within home and then our user. So mine is Corey MS. Now this tilde here is uh, just an alias for our home directory. So that's that's one way that you can tell that we are in our home directory. So within our home directory, I'm going to make a .ssh directory. So I'm going to say mkdir, and I'm going to make a directory called .ssh. Okay, so now I'm going to stay logged into my server, but I'm going to open up uh, the terminal on my local machine. So now I'm going to uh, move this over here. So now I'm on my local machine, not on my server. Now, again, I'm doing this in Bash, but if you're using a program like Putty on Windows that we talked about before, then you'll have to do this differently to create and copy your SSH keys to your web server. And I did find some documentation in Linode's guides for Putty users on how you can do this through Putty. And I'll put a link to that in the description section below uh, so that you can follow along with this part. So you can use that guide if you need it. But if you are using Bash, then we can simply say SSH dash key gen and then I'm going to do a dash b4096 and that's just uh, to make it a little more secure. So now it says it's generating the public private RSA key pair enter the file in which you you wish to save this and it gives a default file here. I'm just going to leave that default file and it says that there's one already there because I already have some SSH keys. I'm just going to overwrite that for this tutorial and now it says to enter a passphrase. Now you can leave an empty passphrase which I'm going to do but if you want to make it more secure then you can use a passphrase for your key. Okay, so now that we've created that, it says that uh, your identification has been saved and we got this ID RSA file and we also got this ID RSA.pub. That is our public key. Now we're going to want to move our public key to our server. So to do this, I'm going to clear my screen here. Uh, to do this on Bash, I'm going to use the SCP command, which I believe stands for secure copy. So I'm going to say SCP and the location of that public key, if you use the default location, is going to be in your user's home folder, dot SSH and forward slash ID underscore RSA dot pub. And we want to copy that public key up to our server. So now I'm going to say uh, Corey MS at, and now the IP address. So you want to put in your IP address here. Mine is 45.33.123.214. So that is the user and the server to where we want to copy that key. Now, if we want to copy it to an exact location on that server, then we can put in a colon here and now specify that exact location. So I'm going to put a tilde for the home directory of this user. Uh, so a tilde forward slash dot SSH. And I want to save that public key into a file called authorized underscore keys. Now you don't need file extensions on Linux. So this is a valid file name here. We can just call it authorized underscore keys. So I'm going to run that. And this is going to ask us for our password because we haven't set up our SSH keys yet. So I'm going to say put in my password here. And we can see that it copied that key up. So now I'm going to minimize uh, this 
terminal window here and go back to my server. So now in my server, I'm going to see if that file is there. So I'm going to do an ls on the .ssh directory. And if I do that, we can see that we now have this file here called authorized keys. And that should be the public key that we copied up. Okay, so now that we've got that copied up, now we need to update some permissions. And again, I can't go into deep detail as to what every command is doing in this video, or else it would just run on for a long, long time. But basically what we're going to be doing here is setting the permissions for the SSH directory to where the owner of the directory has read, write, and execute permissions on the directory. And the owner of the files in that directory will have read and write permissions on the files. So to do that, I'm going to do a sudo chmod, that's how you change permissions, and I'm going to do 700 permissions on the .ssh directory in my home folder, and it's going to ask us for a sudo password. Uh, this is just going to ask us this one time every so often. Uh, we're not going to have to put that in every time we run a sudo password because it'll remember us for some time. Um, so now I'm also going to uh, do a command here where I'm going to do a sudo chmod 600 and I'm going to do this on all of the files in that SSH directory. So I will run that. Now again, I don't have the time to go into deep uh, detail about this here, uh, but basically what these permissions are in Linux, uh, the first digit here are the permissions for the owner of that file, the user who owns that file. So we have a seven here, which means read, write, and execute. Now the second one here, we have a zero, means no permissions. That's for the group of that directory. Uh, and the last one here is for everyone else, and that's a zero as well. Um, and here we're saying that we want 600 permissions for the owner, uh, zero permissions for the group, and zero permissions for everyone else on the files in that directory. Okay, so with those changes in place, we should now be able to log in to this server without a password, and instead it's going to use our public and private SSH keys. So if I exit out of the server here, now we're back on our local machine. Now I'm going to clear my screen. I'm just going to hit the up row here to where we, uh, to run the same SSH command that we did before. And if I run that, then we can see that I was able to SSH into that machine without a password. So that is a good sign. That means that we're using our SSH keys. Okay, so we're just about ready to start moving up our Flask application, but there's just a couple more things that we need to do here. So now that we have our SSH keys working, we also need to disallow root logins over SSH. So uh, now that we're logged in as our user, um, let's do a... Uh, an update on this ssh config file. So I'm going to do a sudo nano, and this is within forward slash etc forward slash ssh uh, forward slash sshd underscore config. So if we run this, put in my sudo password here. So this is the ssh configuration file. So I'm going to scroll down here, and we're going to want to change two values in this configuration file. So first we want to scroll down until we see uh, one option here that says permit root login. We're going to want to change this to no because we have a limited user now that has sudo access. So there shouldn't be any need for us to log into our machine as root. So if a hacker tries to log in as root, we're going to know that, hey, you don't need to be able to do that. Um, so with that set, uh, now let's also scroll down and we're going to look for one called password authentication. So let's keep scrolling down here. And here it is here. It's most likely going to be commented out. So I'm going to uncomment out this here. And I'm going to change this from yes to no. So the reason behind this is that now that we have our SSH keys working, sometimes hackers will just, you know, simply try to brute force passwords. But since we have our SSH keys, uh, we shouldn't have the need to log into our system with a password. So I'm going to put password authentication to no. So now to save this, I'm just going to hit control X and then a Y to save and then enter to keep the same file name. And now we want to restart our SSH service. So to do that, we can say sudo systemctl restart, and that's sshd. So let's run that, and that restarts our SSH service. Okay, so now uh, before we get to the Flask deployment, we are going to set up a firewall, but this is going to be very quick here. This is uh, pretty simple. So first, we want to 
do an installation. So I'm going to say sudo apt install, and this is called UFW, and this stands for uncomplicated firewall. So I'm going to run that. And once that's installed, uh, we're going to set up a few rules here. Now this is called uncomplicated firewall because this is a lot easier than some of the other options like IT tables or anything like that. So the rules that we're going to set up, we're just going to do a sudo UFW uh, default allow, and we're going to allow outgoing traffic. So I'm going to run that. And now I'm going to hit the up arrow here and do a sudo UFW default deny incoming traffic. So now we want to configure a default deny rule, or I'm sorry, we're going to want to configure uh, allow rules for certain ports because configuring a default deny rule like we just did can lock you out of your server unless you use explicit allow rules. So we want to be sure that we have configured these next allow rules to allow for SSH and HTTP and things like that and any port that we want to access from the outside of our server. So I'm going to say uh, sudo ufw allow SSH. Now this one is definitely important because if we don't allow SSH, then we're not going to be able to SSH into our server. So you definitely want to do that one. Uh, so now let's also allow access to port 5000 for now. Now port 5000, if you remember from earlier in the series, is the port that Flash development server runs on. So we're going to test this before we actually go live with it uh, on port 80. Uh, so let's allow that port 5000 so that we can test that on that port. So I'm going to do a sudo ufw allow 5000. And now let's uh, not allow port 80 or HTTP traffic yet uh, until we're sure that everything's working the way that we want it to. And we will allow that port later in the video. So right now I'm going to enable uh, everything that we have just set. So I'm going to do a sudo ufw enable and run that. And it says that the command may disrupt existing connections. Hopefully we remembered to allow SSH connections. So I'm just going to say yes. Okay, so we're still logged in. So that's good. Now if you want to see the status of the things that you've allowed and disallowed, you can go to sudo ufw status and that'll show you everything that we've allowed. So port 22 here is SSH, and we also have port 5000 here. Okay, so that is all of the server setup type of stuff. So now we're ready to deploy our Flask application. So first, we want to put our application on our web server. Now there are multiple ways that we can get this application to our web server. So if we have it checked into a Git repository, then we could simply do a Git clone uh, here into our server. Uh, if you're using an FTP client like FileZilla, then you can just simply uh, copy it over to your server. Uh, since we're already uh, using the command line in this video, I'm just going to use the bash terminal to do this. So I'm going to clear my screen here on my server. And now let me open up my terminal here on my local machine. Now, before we push our Flask application to our server, if we're using a virtual environment, then we're going to want to create a requirements.txt file that captures everything that we need to install for our Flash project to work. So I am in a virtual environment here on my machine. This is the virtual environment that I use throughout the entire series. If you're not using a virtual environment, then you'll just simply have to pip install everything that you used on the server manually. But if we are using a virtual environment, then we can see everything that we use in our project by running pip freeze. If we run pip freeze, then this shows us all of the dependencies for our project that we've installed. So you can see here we have uh, bcrypt, we have flask, obviously. Um, we have flask WTF, which is the forms, uh, Jinja2, which is the templating, pillow, which does our images. And these also give us the exact versions of those packages as well, uh, so that we're sure that everything on our server matches every uh, package version in development. Now, if you're on Windows, then you can create a requirements.txt file and just paste in all of the info from this uh, pip freeze command. But if you're on Mac or Linux, uh, then we can just create our requirements.txt file by saying pip freeze. And then we can uh, put the contents of that pip freeze command into requirements.txt. 
Okay, so now I just created this requirements.txt uh, file on my machine, and I'm in the home folder of my machine here. So I'm gonna open up my file explorer here and open up both of these windows. So this is my home folder here, and here's that requirements.txt file. And here is my Flask blog. This is our Flask project that we've been making throughout this series. So I'm just going to drop that requirements.txt file into that Flask blog. Okay, so now that we have that requirements file, uh, now let's put our Flask application onto our web server. Um, now, uh, since I'm using bash, I'm gonna use the same SCP command that I used earlier to copy up our keys. But if you're not using bash, then again, you can use something like FileZilla or Git to get your project folder onto your server. But for me, I'm simply gonna say uh, SCP dash R, that's for recursive. That means that we're gonna move over an entire directory. So I'm gonna say dash R, and that is, whoop, this is on my desktop. So on my desktop, flask blog, I'm just gonna move over that entire folder, and we're gonna move that to coreyms at, and now the IP address. So you're gonna want your user here, and now your IP address. My IP address is 45.33.123, dot two one four and now we want the colon and the colon we can specify an exact location uh, for on this machine so I'm just going to put it in that user's home folder by saying tilde forward slash so let's run that Okay, and it looks like it copied everything over for us. So now let's check that that's there on our server. So now I'm gonna minimize our local machine here and go back to our server. So you can see how this is useful having these two windows open uh, because otherwise you'd have to be exiting and SSHing back into your server and local machine all the time. Okay, so now that we're back on our server here, let's run the ls command to see if we have our directory. So we do have our Flask blog here, so that's good. So now we have our Flask application on our web server. So now we're ready to get it running on here. So first, in order to do this, we're gonna to have to create a virtual environment on our server. We don't wanna use the default Python that's running on our Linux system. We always want to use a virtual environment when running on our server. So to do this, we're gonna to want to install a few things. So I'm gonna say sudo apt install, and we want to install python3-pip. Now make sure you have the three there for Python 3, otherwise it'll install for Python 2. So we're gonna do the sudo apt install python3 dash pip. And once that's finished, I'm going to clear my screen here. And now I'm gonna install uh, sudo, so I'll do a sudo apt install. And I'm gonna install python3 dash venv. And this will allow us to create virtual environments. So let's run that. And this should install fairly quickly. Okay, so now that we have those two packages installed, uh, now we can create our virtual environment. So I'm just going to create this virtual environment inside of our Flask project. So I'm gonna say Python 3-mvenv, and this will create a new virtual environment. Now we just have to specify where we want that virtual environment. So I'm gonna put this within Flask blog, and I'm gonna call this virtual environment venv. So I will run that command, and that should have created that virtual environment. So let's check. So I'll do a cd into Flask blog, and now if we do an ls, we can see that we have our you know, project directory, flash blog, our requirements file, run.py, but we also have this venv directory. So that's our virtual environment. So in order to activate that, we can simply say source venv forward slash bin forward slash activate. So I'll run that. And now our virtual environment should be activated. And a good hint is here at the beginning of our prompt in parentheses here, it says venv. So our virtual environment is activated. So with that activated, we can now install all of our requirements for our project. So in order to insta install all of the uh, dependencies from this requirements.txt file, we can simply say pip install dash r. And after we do the dash r, we put the path to the requirements.txt file. So it's just here in the same directory. So I can just say requirements.txt. So if I run that, then it's going to install everything that we need for our application. 
Okay, so that should have installed all of the Python packages that we need for our application. So now we want to test our website using the development server and make sure that it works using that development server before we install Nginx and GUnicorn. But before we test this, there are a couple of variables that we first need to set. So if you remember, on our local machine, we set some environment variables for our secret key, our database URL, our email user and our email password for our password resets. And we're going to need to set those on our server before our application will work properly. Now on our local machine, we used environment variables and we could use environment variables here as well. But I think that uh, sometimes uh, environment variables can be a little tricky when working with different web servers. So instead, let's just create a configuration file with all of our sensitive information and we'll load that into our application instead of our environment variables. So first, I'm going to go back to my local machine and grab the values of those environment variables so that we can add them to our server. So I'm going to clear my screen here on the server, and now I'm going to open back up uh, my local machine here. Now there are a couple of different ways that we can get those environment variables. Now if your Flask environment is activated, then you should be able to grab all of those just by using Python. So I'm just going to put Python here to open up our Python command line, and now I'm going to import OS. And now we want to grab our secret key. So I'm going to say os.environ.get, and we want to get that secret underscore key. So that is the secret key that we used for this project. So now I'm going to want to do the same thing, uh, except I'm also going to want uh, the SQL alchemy underscore database underscore URI. So let's run that. Now, if you're wondering what all environment variables you need, we set all of these in our Flask configuration file. So if you look in that Flask configuration file, you should be able to see where you're using these environment variables. It should say os.environment.get and then secret key, SQL alchemy database URI and et cetera. Now we also need to grab our uh, email user. So email underscore user and also our email underscore pass. So my email user is just my email address. Uh, now my email password, I'm not going to actually hit enter here and show my email password. Uh, for obvious reasons, I don't want people to be able to log in uh, to my email. Um, but off camera, I'm going to grab this email pass uh, value here as well, and put this within the configuration on my server. Okay, so now that I have these printed out here, I'm going to go back to my server and I'm going to create a config file. So I'm going to say sudo touch and touch will create a file. I'm going to create this in forward slash etc forward slash config dot JSON. Uh, now I'm calling it config.json because this is going to be the only Flask application that lives on this server. If you need to differ differentiate between multiple Flask applications, then you could call this, you know, Flask blog config or something like that instead. Then I'm also using JSON for this file, but if you're more comfortable using YAML or something like that, then you can use that as well. So I'm going to create that file and now I'm going to edit that file. So sudo nano dash etc config dot json fig dot json okay and within this file we're going to create a json here so we need these opening and closing curly braces and first we want to create a value for secret key so the value for our secret key that needs to be in double quotes i'm going to go back to my local machine here i'm just going to grab that value from our local machine and go back to our server and paste that in and then put in a comma here. And now I will do the same for, I'm actually going to uh, copy this key because it's a long one, SQL Alchemy Database URI. Um, let me move this over just a little bit here. Um, okay, so I will paste that in for the key and the value for that key was, let me move this over a little bit here. The value for that key was just our simple SQL Lite database. So I will paste that in. And don't forget your commas here after these key value pairs in your JSON. So now we need our email user and our email pass. Now you're gonna put in your email user here and your email 
pass. Now, I'm not going to uh, put those here in this video because uh, that is sensitive private information for myself. Uh, but off video, I'm going to put those values in so that we can see how the password reset functionality works uh, on our server. So I'm just going to save this file. So I'll hit Control X, Y to save and then enter. And now I'm going to pause the video and go back in to that config.json. And I'm going to put in my email username and my email password uh, so that that functionality works here on the server. I'm just not going to show it on video. So I will resume the video once I finish with that. Okay, so I went back in that config file and I put my email user and my email pass. So now whenever we test this, uh, that reset password functionality should work with our email service. Um, okay, so now that we've created this config.json file, now we're going to want to edit our config file in our Flask project uh, and set those values. So I'm going to do, if we do an ls here on our Flask blog, you can see that this Flask blog directory here uh, contains our other project files. So I'm going to do an ls on Flask blog, and you can see that that is where our config.py file lives. So I'm going to edit that file. So I'm going to do a sudo nano Flask blog config.py. And within this file here at the top, I'm going to import JSON since we're now using JSON instead of environment variables. and also here at the top, I'm going to load in those values. So I'm going to say with open, and we're going to open that file that we just created. And so this is the path. So it was in forward slash etc forward slash config dot JSON. And we will open that as config underscore file. And now within here, we will say config is equal to json.load and load in that config file. Now when you use json.load on a json file, what that does in Python is it makes this variable here a Python dictionary. So now this Python dictionary called config is equal to all of the key value pairs from our json config file. So now here uh, at the bottom parts of our file, let me scroll up here a little bit, uh, everywhere that we're using environ os.environ.git, we can now use config.git uh, since config right here is a dictionary with those configuration uh, values. So instead of os.environ, I'm going to say config.git. So we're doing config.git on the secret key. We're going to do a config dot git on the SQL Alchemy database URI and we are going to do a config dot git on the email user and on the email pass. Okay, so once that is done, I'm just going to save that file. So since I'm using nano, that's control X, Y to save and then enter. Okay, so now we're ready to actually test our application and see if it works on our server. So there are a couple of ways we can test the application. Uh, let me clear my screen. If you remember, we can do a, if I do an LS here on our project, we can see we have this run.py. If you remember, I usually do this Python run.py. Um, but if I do a cat on that file and print out the contents of that file, uh, then we can see if I run that, then it's just going to do an app.run of debug equal true. But I actually want to set our host equal to 0, .0, 0.0.0.0. And what that'll do is that will expose it uh, to the uh, outside world. Um, so to do that, instead of doing Python run.py, I'm just going to do like we saw earlier in the series, and I'm going to use flask run. Now, if you remember, in order to use flask run, uh, I have to uh, do an export of our flask project. So I'm going to do an export, and this is just going to create a temporary environment variable so that we can test this. So I'll say export flask underscore app is equal to, and there's no spaces here, uh, so is equal to run.py, because that is what contains our application. So now that we've done that export flask app equals run.py, now I can simply do flask run. Now don't hit enter yet. Uh, instead of doing flask run, we also want to set the host. So I'm going to set the host 
equal to 0.0.0.0. And that will allow us to access this development server from the outside, so from our browser. So I'm going to run that and it should spin up our server so we can see that it's running uh, on our IP address uh, on port 5000. So now if I open my browser here, then, oops, let me uh, actually open up my other browser here. Um, so now I want to go to my IP address at port 5000. So my IP address, you're going to want to use yours. Mine was 45.33.123.214. Um, now, if we just go to that IP address, then we're not going to get anything because port 80 currently isn't open on our firewall. Um, so you can see it says the site can't be reached. So to go to a specific port, we want to put in colon 5000 to go to port 5000. If I run that, then you can see that we get what seems to be our application. Okay, so it looks like our application is working, but we're always going to want to do a little bit of testing here. Um, so to make sure that the functionality is working, let's try a couple of things. So let's go to uh, log in and see if we can log in as a current user. So I will try to log in as my Corey M. Schaefer user. It looks like that worked. Uh, log out. That seems to work. Let's go to register and try to create a new user. So I'm going to create a new user here and just call this deployed user. Uh, for the email, I'll do deployed user at test.com. Uh, password, I'll just do testing, password, testing, sign up. And that seemed to work. So now let's try that. So deployed user at test.com, testing to log in. That seems to work. Let's try to create a new post, um, deployed post, and I will copy that and post that. So it looks like that worked. Let's see if we can update a post. Updated deployed post. That works. Um, let's try to delete a post. So if I delete a post, that seems to work as well. Um, let's see if we can change our profile picture. So right now we just have this uh, default profile picture. Um, I will try to choose a new picture here. Just choose one from my desktop. Update that and that seemed to work. Okay, that's good. Um, and let's also test that our email is working. So if I go to uh, login, forgot password, if I say that I forgot my password for my Corey M. Schaefer uh, Gmail account, if I run that, then it says an email has been sent with the instructions to reset your password. I actually have my Gmail opened up here. Um, and we can see that I got the password reset request here. So if I click on that, then we can see that I got my password reset link and I can now change my password. So instead I'll change that to testing one, two, three, instead of just testing. And if we log in with that new password, testing one, two, three, then that seems to work. Okay. So everything, all of our functionality for our website seems to be working. So that's good. Um, but if we go back to our server here, we are running a development server on our uh, live production server. This is not what you want to do. This is great for testing, but you don't want uh, to go live with this and send this URL out using a development server. It's a development server for a reason. It's not meant uh, for, you know, a lot of performance and to be hit by a lot of people. So that's why you use something like Nginx and G Unicorn, because those applications are, you know, do allow uh, for high traffic and for good performance. So now we're going to want to get our application working with Nginx and G Unicorn. But this is a very good sign that it's currently working in our development server. So now I'm going to kill this by hitting Control C and clearing my screen here. And now let's install Nginx and G Unicorn. So I'm going to CD back to my home directory just so I have uh, more room here to work with. And now I'm going to say sudo apt install. And we're going to want to install Nginx. X. So let's run that. And once Nginx is installed, then I will clear my screen here. And now we want to install G Unicorn. So we can actually install G Unicorn with pip. So I can do pip install. Now you're going to want to make sure 
that you are still within your virtual environment here. So make sure that you haven't deactivated that because we want to install G Unicorn in that virtual environment. So I'm going to do a pip install uh, G Unicorn. So we will run that. Okay, and once that's installed, we just need to change a couple of configurations with Nginx and with G Unicorn, and we will be done. So first of all, we're going to uh, update the configuration file for Nginx. So the way that Nginx and G Unicorn work together is that Nginx is going to be our web server, and it's going to handle the request uh, such as static files and things like that. It's not actually going to handle the Python code. It's going to use G Unicorn to do that. So um, we're going to allow Nginx to handle, you know, like the static information, like the CSS files and JavaScript and pictures and things like that. But when it comes to handling Python code, we're going to pass that off to G Unicorn. So in order to do this, uh, first, let me clear my screen here. First, let's remove the default Nginx configuration file. So I'm going to say sudo rm, and this was was in, is in forward slash etc nginx and sites enabled sites hyphen enabled and default so we're just going to remove that default file and now we're going to create a new file so this is going to be sudo nano and we will so this is going to be in forward slash etc forward slash nginx forward slash uh, sites dash enabled and we will call this flask log. So let's run that. This is a new file. This doesn't exist yet. So it's going to be completely blank. So now to create an Nginx configuration file, uh, we're just going to say server. And then in these curly braces here, we will say listen on port 80. And you're going to want to remember these semicolons here. I know that writing Python code, we're not used to putting in semicolons. Uh, but here you have to remember that. So now uh, we need server underscore name, and that is going to be equal to, for now, it's just going to be our IP address. So my IP address, you're going to want to put in yours. Mine is 45.33.123.214, semicolon. And now we're going to forward all of our static files. So our CSS and JavaScript and our pictures and stuff like that. We're going to let Nginx handle that, but we need to tell uh, Nginx where those are located. So I'm going to say location forward slash static and then another pair of opening and closing curly braces. Um, so for location static, that is going to be aliased. So alias to forward slash home. And then your username, my username is Corey MS, but you want to put yours. And then your project, mine is flask underscore blog. Um, and now the location to our static directory. Um, so within that flask blog directory, I have another directory called flask blog that holds our project files. And then there's a static folder within there. So you're going to want to put the location to your static folder, but it should be something like that if you've been following along with this series. Okay, so having that in place, uh, now we're ready to uh, forward all of the other traffic to G Unicorn. So now we can say location and just do a forward slash and then some opening and closing curly braces here. Now I am going to put this file, this um, Nginx configuration file, I am going to put this on GitHub if you're worried about uh, mistyping any of this. So I will have this up on GitHub so that you can use that as a reference. Okay, so at this location here, uh, at this root location, basically this means if we go to our IP address, then this is what's going to happen. So we're going to do a, a proxy underscore pass, and then we're going to pass this off to G Unicorn. Now, by default, G Unicorn runs on port 8000. So I'm just going to say, do a proxy pass to HTTP forward slash localhost. So our localhost is the server in this case on port 8000. So that'll forward all that traffic to G Unicorn and let that handle the Python code. Um, now there's also a couple of other things we're going to want to add in here that just uh, passes some extra variables for that proxy. So to do this, we're just going to say include and we're want, going to want to include this file here, uh, forward slash etc forward slash nginx forward slash proxy underscore params and put a semicolon there. And then we will also do a proxy underscore redirect off and then a semicolon. 
Now, there are all kinds of things that Nginx can do. If you want to know any more details about any of this stuff, then I would highly suggest looking at the Nginx documentation, and it'll explain in more detail what a lot of this stuff is doing. Uh, but this should be good for our Nginx configuration file. So I'm going to save this. So since I'm using Nano, I'll hit Control X, uh, Y to save, and then hit Enter. Okay, so in our Nginx configuration file, we said that we were listening on port 80. So if you remember, we haven't actually opened up that port on our firewall yet. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna say sudo UFW, our uncomplicated firewall, allow, and we will allow HTTP TCP traffic. So it said that it added those rules. And since we are done with our testing, we will also disallow any traffic on port 5000 since that was our testing port. So I'm going to say a sudo UFW delete, and I will delete the allow of port 5000. So again, I'll make sure that that is enabled. So sudo UFW enable and hit Y for yes. Okay. And now we want to restart our Nginx server. So I'm going to say sudo system CTL uh, restart engine X. Okay, so that restarted our engine X server. So now I'm going to clear my screen. So now our engine X server is running, but G unicorn is not running. So our server is not going to know how to handle that Python code. So if I go back to my browser here, and I try to reload this page, then it's not going to work. Uh, so if I just let this spin up here, it'll give me an Nginx error eventually. Oh, and I'm actually still on port 5000 here, so that's not going to work at all. Um, and actually, instead of using uh, regular Chrome here, I'm gonna go back to using my incognito because incognito, if you don't know, uh, it doesn't cache things like H or uh, CSS and things like that. So it's easier for development. Um, so if I run that, then you can see that we got a 502 bad gateway and we can see that this is an engine X error here. Um, now that is because it's listening on port 80. So we got uh, in contact with engine X, but it doesn't know how to forward Python code. So we have to run G Unicorn. So the engine X uh, forwards this request to G Unicorn and then G Unicorn knows how to handle that Python code. Now we can access our static files. So if we try to access like one of our CSS files, I can go to forward slash static uh, forward slash main dot CSS, that should be working because that is just Nginx handling that information. So we can see that we can see our CSS code here. So that works, um, but we need to run GUnicorn in order to get the Python code working. So let's go back to our server here, and now let's get GUnicorn working. Now, to run GUnicorn, it's actually a very simple command. We can just run GUnicorn, and then we can also run some workers here. So I can say uh, dash W, and then the amount of workers. So I can say three, and then we want to specify the file that has our application. So the module that contains our application variable is run.py. So we can just say run and then a colon and then the variable name of our application. So the variable name in our application is app. Now I'm not gonna run this yet uh, because I actually have to change directories here. But first of all, let me also explain this workers here. So a lot of people say, okay, how many workers do I need to run for my machine? Well, if you look in the G Unicorn documentation, then they say that the number of workers should be uh, two times the number of cores on your machine plus one. So in order to see the number of cores on your machine, uh, it's pretty easy to figure that out in Linux. Uh, one way you can just do an NPROC dash dash all. And remember, we got the nanode version of Linode here, which is our cheapest version. So I just have one core here. So that's why I chose three workers because that is two times our number of cores, which would be two plus one. So that's how you figure that out if you're interested. Okay, so in order to run G Unicorn here, I'm gonna actually CD back into my Flask blog. And now if I do an LS, we can see that we have run.py here. Now let me cat out the contents of that file. And you can see that within run.py, we have app equal to our create app. And that's what creates our Flask application. So to run that G unicorn code again, again, it's G unicorn, and I'm gonna use 
three workers, and that is within the run module, and that uh, variable for our application is app. So if I run that, then we can see that it says that it's listening on our local host at port 8000 and that it booted up three workers uh, for three different processes. So now if we go back to uh, our browser here and reopen this in our browser, you can see that now we are just going to our IP address and Nginx is forwarding that traffic to GUnicorn and GUnicorn is handling this Python code. So now our website is working in production. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all the same tests that I did before, but we can see if I just, you know, try to log in, we can see that at least that is working. So it seems to be working well so far. Um, but there is one more thing that we want to do. This isn't quite ready for production just yet. Um, because if we look at our server, you know, this isn't really good the way that this is running here because this is running in the foreground. We can't do anything on our server here. This has to remain open. So if I was to close my server, so if I hit control C and stop that, then we just killed G unicorn. And if I run, uh, try to reload the page, this isn't working anymore. So what we need is something that is constantly monitoring G unicorn and making sure that it's running and will auto start it and auto restart it if it crashes and things like that. So in order to do that, we're going to use some software called supervisor, and this is very easy to use on Linux. So to install supervisor, I'm just going to say sudo apt install, and this is called supervisor. So let's run that and install that. I'll say yes. Okay, and once that is installed, we just need to set up a quick and easy uh, configuration file for supervisor. So to do this, we'll say sudo nano, and this is going to be in forward slash etc, forward slash supervisor, conf.d, and within conf.d, we're going to create a configuration file. So this is going to be flask blog.conf. Uh, sorry that this is running on the other line here. I know that that makes it hard to read, uh, but I called this flaskblog.conf. So if we run that, then now we have a blank configuration file here. And I'm going to put this file up on GitHub as well. Uh, but to create a supervisor configuration file here, first we can just put these square brackets. First we want to say program and the name of our program. So I'm just going to call this flask blog. And now we want to put in a few uh, variables here. So I'm going to say directory. So directory is where this is going to run a certain command from. So we want to run a command from our flask project. So this is uh, in forward slash home, forward slash CMS, you're going to want to put your username there. And mine is called flask underscore blog. And now we want to put in the command that we want to run. So the command that we want to run from that directory is uh, G unicorn with three workers and then run app. Now, if you remember G unicorn is actually in our virtual environment uh, and we're not going to activate the virtual environment here from within our configuration file. So instead you're going to want to put in the full path to G unicorn. And that is just within the bin folder of your virtual environment. So this is going to be a little long here, but this is uh, within our home directory of our user. And that is within flask blog is where I put that virtual environment. And that virtual environment was called V E and V. And within the bin folder of that virtual environment, that is where the G unicorn command lives. So we want to run that command with three workers. So I'll say dash W three. And remember that is just, uh, we want to run that on the run module and app is the name of our application. Um, so now a few more things here, we'll say user is equal to Corey MS. Uh, we want to do an auto start equal to true. That means that the, that supervisor will make sure that this auto starts, uh, we'll set an auto restart equal to true. That is if it crashes for any reason, then it's just going to start it right back up. Now we also want to do a stop as group, make sure that's spelled right, equal to true, and a kill as group equal 
to true. And that's just going to help, uh, you know, if we stop or kill this, it's going to help wrap up any child processes. Now we also want to do some uh, error and log files here. So I can say STDERR, so standard error, uh, underscore log file is equal to, and we will create this log file in a second, but we will put this in forward slash var, forward slash log, forward slash flask blog, forward slash, uh, let's see, we'll just call this uh, flask blog dot err dot log for our error log. And I'm going to just highlight this and copy it so I don't have to type all this out again, paste this in. And for our standard out, I'm just going to call this uh, flask blog uh, dot out dot log. And back here at the beginning, this is going to be the standard out log file. Okay, and that is it. And again, I'm going to put this on my GitHub repository if you want to uh, check and make sure that all of this uh, looks good if you want to, you know, look at this on the GitHub page. So I will hit Control X, Y to save and hit enter. And now uh, we want to create those uh, log files really quick. So in order to do that, I'm just going to say sudo make dir and I'll do a dash p. A dash p will create any uh, directory in the chain if none of them exist. So I'll say dash var dash log dash flask blog. And now we called those log files. So I'll do a sudo touch. We called those that was within forward slash var slash log flask blog. We called that flask blog dot e r r dot log. So I'll run that and I'll hit the up arrow here. We also want to do flask blog dot out dot log. So I'll run that. Okay, so now that I have all of that in place, I'm just going to restart our supervisor. So in order to do that, I'll just do sudo uh, supervisor ctl reload. So if I run that, we can see that it restarted supervisor. So now if we reload our page in the browser here, sometimes it can take a while for a supervisor to uh, start up that process. If I run that now, we can see that it's already working. So now if you wanted to, then you could go through and check that make sure all of this, uh, you know, functionality is working correctly. So, you know, if I go in here and change uh, some pictures and try to update this, we can see that that works. Uh, we can create new posts. So if I run that new post, we can update. And it's always good to check this functionality just to make sure that nothing is off. Um, so one thing that you might notice here, if I go and change my profile picture, now that we're using Nginx as a web server, uh, Nginx has some defaults that you might not expect. So you could get some unexpected things with your application. And that's just kind of knowing your web server. Um, so for example, if I choose a really large file here, so I have a file on my desktop called large.jpg. If I open that and I try to update that as my profile picture, if I do that, you can see it's going to spin here for a little bit. And then it's going to give me an Nginx error. And it says 413 request entity too large. Now this is an Nginx default. It won't accept uh, client, you know, upload sizes over, I think it's two megabytes. And I think that that two, that picture is 2.8 megabytes. Now, if you want to change this, you might not even have that need for your application. So if you don't have the need, then that's completely fine. But if you do have the need and you need to change that, then here within our server, uh, I'm going to clear the screen here. You can update that by going to sudo nano. That's in forward slash etc, forward slash engine x, uh, forward slash engine x dot conf. So within here, if we scroll down to HTTP, then I am going to just come in here past um, at the bottom of the basic settings here. And you can just set a variable called uh, client underscore max underscore body underscore size. And I'm just going to set that to uh, five megabytes. So you can set that to whatever you want to set it as. If you remember the application that we created in this video um, automatically resizes large uploads to a smaller upload anyway. Um, so I will save that and then you can restart Nginx by doing a sudo 
system CTL restart of engine X. So now if I go back to my account page and try to upload that same large file again, then we can see that this time it worked. And if I open the picture in a new tab, uh, then we can see that it's a small picture anyways, because our web application that we created takes those large images and uh, resizes them down to, I think, 125 pixels is what we chose. Okay, and real quick, just to make sure that the password reset is working as well, you know, that's something that is easy to, uh, to not work sometimes. So I can go to forgot password, uh, type in our email address and request that password reset. So if I open up my email address here, so I'll go back to my inbox and we can see that we have a password reset and go there and that, oops, let me click on that reset link. Oh, and I don't think that that worked because I was still logged in here um, when inside of uh, this browser. Um, so if I log out in that browser and then go back using that reset link, you can see that now that that works. Um, so testing one, two, three. Yeah, so that seems to work. Um, okay, so let me go back to our homepage here. So now that we're using supervisor, if I completely log out of my server, so I'm back here on the server, if I just go to exit and I can just close down my, all of my terminals completely, if I close all of those down, then we can see that I can, you know, do a hard refresh on my pages here. And this is all still working. So we have a completely functional website that is working on our IP address that is fully deployed at this point. Now there's still a lot more that we could do in future videos if you're interested. So right now we only have an IP address, uh, but if you want, then I could also walk through the process of buying a domain name and how to get that domain name uh, to go to this server that we've set up. Uh, we could also see how to add SSL certificates so that we can have an HTTPS domain name. Uh, that's actually something that I still need to do for my personal website as well. I'm still using HTTP. Um, now, I'm actually going to uh, delete this server after this video. So if you go to this IP address here, then you're not gonna see this website. So if you go to this IP address, then that's why you won't see this. So if we do continue this series, then I'll spin this server back up with a different IP address when I record more videos for this series. Now, actually, let me go ahead and delete this server uh, on this video so that if you're following along, then you can do this as well uh, so that you're not charged for it. So let me go back here to my Linode and I probably need to log back in. No, it looks like I'm still logged in here, so that's good. Now, if you want to completely delete your server, then you can just go to your Linodes here. And over here on the right, you can click on this settings menu here, and you can go down to settings. And once you're at settings, you can see at the bottom here, we have delete Linode. So you could click on delete, and then it's gonna ask you, are you sure that you wanna de delete this because it's gonna result in permanent day loss. Everything that we did in the video is going to be done. Uh, so you can delete by clicking that there. I actually think that I'm just going to power this off for now. So I'm just gonna say power off instead, and I will delete that later. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, uh, Linode was actually kind enough to sponsor this video, and I've used them for many years and have recommended them to people long before I even had any sponsors. So if you get a chance, I would highly recommend giving them a shot. So like we saw earlier in the video, they have this new and improved cloud management system uh, that makes spinning up a server fast and easy. Uh, you can choose from available images, and you can even upload your own custom image if you'd like. And if you're doing something that's fairly common, they even have stack scripts that allow you to spin up a server with all of the relevant software already installed and ready to go. So for example, if you're making, you know, like a WordPress site or something like that, then you can simply choose their WordPress stack script that spins up a server with WordPress ready to go. So if I was to click here on Linode and then here at create an image, if I instead go to create from stack, stack script and then go to Linode stack scripts, we can see that their WordPress stack script is the top one here. And it says a ready to rock WordPress install using the latest release from wordpress.org. So that is pretty neat that they have these images that are just ready to go like that. 
Oh, and it looks like I need to log back in here. Um, now, they also have nine worldwide data centers so far, and they have two more set to open in 2019. So no matter where you are, you should be able to spin up a server close to your audience. So if you want to check them out, then feel free to use my referral link in the description section below, as you can get $20 of free credit applied to your account to try them out. Okay, so with that said, I think that is going to do it for this video. Uh, hopefully now you have a good idea of how you can deploy your Flask application to your own Linux server. Uh, like I said before, this option takes a little more effort than some of the other options out there, but having your own virtual private server gives you so much more flexibility and room to grow with your application. And it also provides some terrific knowledge for learning more about back-end Linux systems. And that's something that, uh, you know, employers really look for nowadays and something that would really shine on a resume. Um, but if you have any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoyed these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. Also, it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.